Hi, everybody, and welcome to the session. I'm Francois Fenter, based in central Johannesburg. I'm a clinician, and I'm going to be talking to you about the practical aspects about um, what we do with our patients who are gaining weight, um, who are HIV positive, stable on their therapy. And um, so uh, these are my disclosures. So this is a thorny issue, and I'm going to use two examples, very different examples, to maybe frame it for you to just as an entry point and how we've been grappling with this. So the first is off our study, which was the one that caused all the trouble, um, the advanced um, study that demonstrated significant weight gain on, on modern regimens. So the first is a real patient, a 35-year-old woman who was on a TAF-based regimen combined with dolutegravir. She came in when we started her on baseline regimen, normal BMI of about 23. Um, and the BMI shot up to 44, despite giving her all lots of dietary advice and telling her to exercise, all the good stuff. Um, we switched her because that's what we did at the time. It wasn't clear at the time that this was a bad thing to do. We know it isn't a good thing to do at the moment. Um, to an efavirin-based regimen combined with tenofovir, but she continued to gain weight up to this 44 um, BMI. And she presented in tears at the clinic eventually, just saying to us, she just couldn't bear this continued weight gain. She just said to us, I'm doing everything you're telling me to do, and yet I'm going to continue to gain weight. I'm spending a fortune on clothing. I feel completely helpless. Please help me. The second patient, um, kind of similar, um, again, a 35-year-old woman, a slightly lower BMI, but still high. Um, and she, on the other hand, was very happy with her weight. She's stable at her BMI of about 35 for a couple of years. Again, completely stable in ARVs. Metabolically, metabolically um, completely fine, blood pressure normal, um, very active lifestyle, was at the gym all the time, vegetarian, very happy marriage with three happy children. And her gripe was that every time she walked through the door, it didn't matter whether it was for a pap smear or because she dropped a brick on her toe, the first thing the doctor or the nurse wanted to talk to her about was trying to fix her weight. And she was angry about this. She was like, I don't want my, to be fixed. I'm fine with my weight. Just stop messing with me. Like, just get on with what my medical problem is. I'm fine with my weight. Um, I'm probably healthier than the vast majority of the medical professionals I'm actually talking to. And it's important to, to look at these two in terms of the discussion we're about to have. So where in HIV land have we landed with weight? And we've heard the previous speakers um, talk about this in detail. And it's important to summarize it because it's a complex area. And I think it's co partly complex because the obesity field is a very new field in terms of our understanding. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that efavirenz is not a good drug. And it's not a good drug because it blunts weight. But with it comes a whole lot of metabolic effects, which are really bad, you know, the kind of rises in lipids and glucose, as well as all the um, neuropsychiatric and hepatic side effects are, are just not worth the, the, the weight loss that comes with it. Uh, it's not a good switch option. But we also know that um, if your patients are gaining weight on the second generation integrase inhibitors, we do not have an evidence base to suggest that switch options to any of the other classes of drugs are going to make any width of difference. There is some suggestion that perhaps deravirine is a promising option in the future, but we don't have firm evidence that that is going to work yet. Um, hopefully, we, I think we're all hoping there will be evidence that other drugs will be a benefit, but we don't know for certain. And we can't promise our patients that it's going to make a difference as yet. Um, and there's a chance that these second generation integrase inhibitors won't, are, as, are actually fat neutral and that in fact our patients will gain as much um, weight on those as they will with any other drug. I think it's clear that tenofovir um, uh, is, um, uh, has modest um, weight mitigating um, potential. And I think the jury's still out about TAF. I think the majority of us think it's weight neutral as are the second generation integrase inhibitors, but there's a chance that better data will come along showing that actually it potentiates weight weight gain. We have risk factors that are very clearly um, predictive of weight gain. And we know that the more advanced disease, when you initiate antiretroviral therapy, if you have a lower CD4 count, and a higher viral load, um, you're going to gain far more weight. And particularly if you're black or if you're a woman. Um, I think something that's often missed mainly because of a lot of the drama was reported around naive studies like Advance and NAMSAL and many others. But all the switch studies have consistently reported this as well. And it's important to understand that the vast majority of patients um, in the world, antiretrovirals are obviously 
currently on antiretrovirals. The numbers of patients initiating antiretroviral therapy every year are actually very, are very, very, very small comparatively to the numbers who are actually on existing chronic care. So when we're talking about the obesogenic potential of these new antiretrovirals, um, whether it's the drugs themselves or just simply because they're best tolerated, um, the numbers of existing patients who are going to need to be counseled is actually manifold um, um, greater. So this is actually a very scary scenario, is that there is a, a world, um, if it's because the new generation of antiretrovirals um, are just so well tolerated, is that we actually may be looking at a world where it doesn't matter what the new generations are that obesity is common to all these new um, um, regimens and that this is a reality we're going to be facing going forward um, for patients with HIV. Now, oddly enough, we've actually got quite a lot of data. We've known this even prior to antiretroviral therapy. We knew that patients with, um, who were heavier actually had a slower trajectory. Their CD4 count went down slower, more slowly um, if they were heavier. And we know that uh, with antiretrovirals, um, there's, there's data now decade old, that their CD4 counts go up better and faster if they're heavier. And it's important for us, I'm going to talk about this because it also operates in the HIV negative world, that we need to differentiate between being um, heavier and being healthier. And I think that this is a consistent theme in the, in the obesity world. It's like being healthy and being sexy are not the same thing. And I think medical healthcare practitioners conflate this routinely, as do the general population. And the obesity world is many steps ahead of us. Um, I've had to become immersed in this world um, as because of advance and having to, to work this. And I'm quite struck at how they are these several steps ahead of what the general medical field is. And the stuff I certainly was trained about is so, so different. And I'm going to be talking about this a lot as we go forward. This really provocative study that Mark Seidner did in rural KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, and which has been repeatedly put forward, um, just talks about some of the debates that are happening in the obesity world. This is not HIV, this is the general population, which they looked just at life expectancy um, in um, rural South Africa. And you can see here that people who are heavier are actually much less likely to die than, and this is not what we were taught at medical school. You know, we were taught that if you're obese, you're much more likely to die. And if you looked at this, you would like be putting McDonald's in every corner of the, um, uh, um, of, uh, you know, of rural health, to, if you were evidence-based, because, you know, obviously uh, obesity is associated with much longer life. Now there are a lot of quite, um, dramatic fights within the obesity world about these kinds of studies. And it's way above my pay grade, but the epidemiologists all are fighting about survival bias around this, whether these kinds of analyses are, are valid or not. But both within the US and in Europe and now in South Africa, these, these arguments about what is a normal BMI and what is a healthy BMI are being tussled around. And certainly what I was taught about what is a normal BMI is, is not, is up for grabs. And this was a study which is, was published eight years ago, a, um, a kind of a, a meta-analysis put out in Nature. And then you can see again that as you get older, the higher your BMI, the actual lower your mortality. And particularly as you get older at the more extremes, being underweight is far more predictive of mortality than being underweight. And what you're seeing now is a big pushback by activists within the, within the um, sort of the overweight and obese community, starting to point out these holes in the science, starting to say that you know, a lot of what you as the medical um, community are doing is actually cruel, that for decades you've ignored the science or you've misportrayed the science and you've waged a war on us as the fat community um, and poisoned the perception, colluded with, particularly with the diet industry. And actually, particularly when you look at the mental um, health um, issues that fat people have to exist, have had to deal with, um, that people with obesity have had to deal with, you've made our lives miserable and you've done it in the name of very, very poor people science and that a new paradigm needs to exist around this and there's been this huge shift around understanding around people with obesity people with um, overweight and it's been really interesting for people like me who've had to come to this as a newcomer and um, to have to like engage with this and I think we as people in HIV are going to have to deal with this community because our people with HIV are going to become overweight in many many cases if not the majority of them um, 
are going to have to relearn all of this. And as I said, there's a lot of anger at this, a lot of the stigmatizing language. I got called out on some of the um, obesity seminars around the language I was using, saying this actually is unacceptable. In the same way that using terms like HIV infected, some of the terms that we use in the LGBTI community and the trans community, you get called out on those of us in the HIV community are completely comfortable now with being called out on. Um, we're going to find out in, you know, people with obesity calling you out on, you're going to, when you start putting your feet in that community, you're going to find out that you're going to get called out. The other thing I found fascinating is the whole physiology of obesity is being reappraised in the last couple of years, that the understandings around basal metabolic rates and where fat goes and how fat, how fat metabolically is operating is being reappraised. And those of you who are interested in the basic science, I urge you to go look at it because it's, again, it's not the stuff I was taught. Even when I became a specialist, it's been reappraised. So some of the interesting stuff that's happening there is that <laughs> when I sit in these seminars, about the only people who think exercise and a diet work for looking at, for addressing obesity are people not involved in the obesity field. There's the general like clinicians and the nurses and the doctors and the lay people think this actually works. And there's a really interesting NEGM review um, put out in 2017 that looked at how poor um, these, these interventions work. And there's just some of those that, you know, that you're quite lucky to even get a 5% weight loss with an really incredibly in, in, uh, um, intense um, approach to diet and exercise. The vast majority of people pretty much put it on. And that, the, that these interventions, even though they actually really have a pretty profound impact on quality of life and just general um, health, have a very low impact on actual weight loss. Um, they have an impact on blood pressure, on lipids, on, on, on glucose, but the actual impact on weight loss is, is pretty poor. And the two together work where exercise by itself does, does extremely little. Diet does far more, but the two together seem to, to impact um, at, at, at a higher degree. There's a huge debate about what a normal value is. Like if you took Mark Seidner's data from KwaZulu and Natal, you'd say a normal value is actually a BMI of 35 because that's associated with the, um, with the lowest mortality, if a normal value is associated with normal mortality. And this philosophical debate almost about what is normal, is it where what most people are? Is it what is associated with the lowest mortality or the best health scores? Or is it what you think um, is normal? And in fact, the, the original BMI values just seem to have been a whole lot of like clinicians and um, basic scientists and physiologists who sort of sucked it out their thumb. Um, and it seems to, you know, it's a really difficult thing for us to start getting our heads around is, you know, what do you assign to be the best BMI? I think the one thing everyone seems to agree on in, in the obesity field is that BMI by itself is not a great measure, for, particularly at an individual level. At a, at a public health level, it's an easy thing to measure and that's useful, but certainly from a, for your patient management level, it's really not great, particularly the thinner you are. Um, the physiology, as I said, is really fascinating and that stuff I was taught, the Barker's hypothesis, you know, when the pregnant women are starving, the child in utero is completely programmed for obesity um, has stood the test of time. I went back and looked and reviewed that and it seems like that pretty much still holds up. But what's interesting is that it's not just the child that's programmed, it's even people who are starved for whatever reason or, um, or starved in the form of dieting or starved in the form of having chronic inflammatory illness, HIV would be a good example, seem to be programmed for obesity. And this is bizarre. So somebody who goes on a really aggressive diet might actually be programmed for obesity. And there's a superb talk at Croyo last year where a obesity physiology, physiologist spoke about this and said that actually we need to start acknowledging the fact that the, some of the interventions we use to address obesity actually might be programming people for future obesity, which is why often people who go on these diets seesaw, but actually end up being larger at the end of it than they started. And this is really has important implications for how we manage our patients. Um, and I think it's important when we start looking at um, at how we think about obesity. And if you ask most of us, we'd all like, you know, it's very much focused on the patient and blaming people around why they're obese. It's very much about, you know, they just can't control themselves. They just snack too much. They eat there too much. They won't get off the couch. They won't stop watching television. They won't get on the exercise bicycle. They won't look after themselves. But when you look, again, as I said, I've had to go and sit on all these obesity webinars. 
the obesity experts don't talk about this stuff at all. It's all about the social determinants. It's about, being, it's about poverty. It's about getting away from food deserts. It's about the genes people are born with. It's about modern food that is tailored to be almost addictive. It's about, you know, it's about the stuff that actually is about the context in which people find themselves rather than the individual like failings that people have. And it's been really interesting for me to look at that because in many ways it reminds me about HIV and about the kind of moral like stuff that we, we, we deal with. And that's interesting as well is that I think it reminds me of what a moral like profession we're in. We love to tell people how to live their lives, you know, whether it's food, whether it's sex, whether it's, uh, you know, it's, whether it's smoking, whether it's anything that feels good, it actually can't really be good for you if it feels good. And it's, um, and it, it really is astonishing how little of the stuff um, is evidence-based when you actually scratch below the surface. And um, I love this quote, which um, this, this uh, Maryland uh, uh, official like had out there, which public health just loves to, to tell you how not to feel good about your life, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and how much anxiety and unpleasantness like we introduce into patients' lives when we, when we do this quite casually often. Um, and we collude with a really unpleasant industry. You know, these people make huge amounts, whether they're selling gym equipment or diet books or, or these ghastly protein shakes. And how many of our people, like our own profession, collude in this, in selling their own crackpot theories? In my own country, there are nutcase doctors who are out there, like, selling their own stuff. And, you know, Dr. Oz being on public television all over the place. Um, and how we play into particularly the mental illnesses that are associated with everything from you know anorexia across to bulimia and all sorts of depression how we make people just feel really really you know rubbish about their about their bodies and stigmatize people's um, body shapes so I've, there's some self-reflection the profession needs to do around this and you tell me what a what a healthy diet is like i just pulled all these like studies out that, that looked at this and i think about the only thing i could take away from all of this is probably processed foods are bad for you you know every other diet is pretty much you know just eating you know less of whatever it is that's being promoted is probably pretty good for you but processed foods are probably not so good for you so it's all very well to get very bleak about this but what do we have um, this is a this any jam paper really superb it really summarizes stuff but you can see these really intensive lifestyle interventions are you know even the most heroic patients only a small proportion of them get more than 10 percent um, of their their weight on and if you follow them over time most of them rebound and actually the weight comes back we've got more and more drugs and there's a revolution happening within um, the drug field that's starting to happen and starting to align with what we see from surgery the problem with surgery is it's extremely expensive it works like a bomb but it's pretty high risk. And even in the richest countries, it's extremely limited in terms of rationed in terms of who gets hold of it. The new drug on the block, which wasn't a part of this, it's only in the last, pretty much the last year, so maglutide, a, a weekly injection, um, is associated with significant weight lo loss and really exciting drug that's coming along made by Nova, very expensive. It's a real blockbuster. Um, in 50% of the patients, they lost 15% or more um, weight in just over a year. This study, this is my second last slide, which really gave me hope, looked, looked at type 2 diabetes. And it's, for HIV, maybe is a bit of the way to go. And it demonstrated that life expectancy in type 2 diabetics, if you really paid attention to the metabolic consequences, to the blood pressure, to the lipids, to the diabetes, if you got those, the target um, values down to where they were supposed to be, people started to have really good outcomes in terms of the cardiovascular outcomes, in terms of the heart outcomes, in terms of death rates. So I think there's something to be said here is if we start paying attention to the complications of obesity, we are probably going to see the same sort of results. And the obesity experts, when I say to people, oh, we're going to put people on obesity drugs for life, the public health people at my university reacted with horror. It's like almost, a, again, a moral reaction, um, saying to them, oh, no, you can't put them on for life. And I think the obesity experts are saying, no, I think this is the way we're going to go. We're going to treat it like hypertension, diabetes. People are going to be on obesity drugs in the same way, probably for life. And this is a massive departure from the past where we use these drugs only for a year or two at a time. So in my final thoughts on this is that we need to be telling our HIV patients up front to be thinking about gaining weight. We need to be talking 
keeping an eye on the ALT, which drugs are best and the rest, but make our peace with the fact that probably there might be small differences between the ARV regimens, but in the end, we're probably going to need other strategies for dealing with the weight gain. We need to be talking about exercise and diet as a good thing, but divorcing it from the weight issue, saying these are things you need to be doing for your general health, not because it's actually linked to weight. We need to be mindful and we need to be aggressively looking at the usual stuff, which is good for them, looking at the lipids, addressing glucose and blood pressure, depending on whatever our country guidelines are. And keeping a close eye on the obesity therapeutic space. There's a revolution happening there. I think in the next few years, we're going to have very clear guidelines there. And finally, using the activism that we've used in HIV to start playing the same role in the obesity space, not becoming part of the problem, but actually starting to look at how we body shaming our patients, starting to play a better role, being better citizens in the medical profession, and starting to play the same role that we did in HIV in terms of addressing obesity. Thanks very much.